Good. Okay. Right. Cool. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started here. Okay? Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, this next session is about building a district and conference scout team. Now, this presentation we'll be going through, it mentions conference, but basically we're going to be talking about the district scout coordinating position and the conference scouting coordinator position. And one of the things that this focuses on, in fact, what this, this session does focus on, is building a team. We have a lot of uh, conferences around the Methodism that have a Lone Ranger scouting coordinator that they're doing the job by him herself or herself. And they're doing great work, but there's only so much that one person can do. So the idea here is to build a conference scout team. A lot of people are intimidated by the prospect because they're not sure how to deploy one or where to find people and how to manage them or organize them. And sometimes there's this feeling that uh, conferences and district superintendents and ministers may not be as friendly to scouting as we like. And in some cases that's true, but in most cases it's not true. And so th the idea here is to find out where there's pockets of support and you'll tap into those. If you see this picture here, you'll see me and uh, five other compatriots in the North Georgia Conference. We were at the North Georgia Annual Conference annual meeting uh, about four years ago, and we were at the volunteer lunch here. And there's a story behind each one of these people where we found them, because we found them in different places. One of them I worked with, the bald-headed guy on the left. And so it was through the business relationship. Yolanda I met through the Atlanta Area Council Boy Scout training, because she's a training chair for there. Uh, the, the guy to the other, uh, the tall one in the middle, Tim, uh, I met him on Atlanta Area Council's Religious Relations Committee. Totally different world than training, religious relations. Uh, and I met uh, Jerry, I, we did scouting together at John Speaker United Methodist Church at a local church level. So I met these people at different places. There's, so there's a lot of different places you can find people to build a, scar, a, car, a, a, a team. So what we're looking at here, one second. These are the things I want to touch base on today. Uh, number one is, do I need a team? Do you really want a team? And this is at the district level and the conference level, so I'm going to use those interchangeably today. Um, a lot of people think I'm fine with just doing, just being myself. And if that's the case, that's fine. Go ahead and manage it and grow it as you can. But there are some benefits to that, uh, to building at least a small team, uh, and we'll talk about those. If you decide to build a team, what kind of team do you need? What, how do you want to deploy them? What do you want them doing on the team? Not just being general members, you want to give them something specific or something general. Uh, and also, where do I find people? I gave you some examples a moment ago about where I found a few people, but we'll talk about others. And there's actually a lot of places to recruit people. Uh, and then also, how do you build it? You don't recruit, you know, I'm not gonna recommend you go from a recruited 20 person team. You start with a couple, you build a couple more, and because those people actually help you and extends from there, so you're not doing all the work. And then I'll show you how do you manage it once you get it up and running. So first thing I'd like to do is talk about the, the, the basic question. Do you need a team, a district team or a, a, uh, a conference guy team? Any perspectives on that? Yes. Yes, uh, especially uh, like before a conference, uh, we, have, we have almost 700 churches over eight districts. So I tried for a year to kind of do it myself, but uh, I've got the well, things going with, with, with I mean, I've been active on the board of late ministry, which is great because it gives me contact with the DSs and with all the district lay leaders. So they know the scout movement. They're all very supportive of it. Bishop, I communicate on numerous occasions. He's very supportive of scouting. So just a matter of now identifying, laying down the groundwork, identifying someone in each district to be the district coordinator, and then going and introducing this local uh, person. That's an excellent testimony, Randy. So for those of you, uh, Randy not only is the conference scout coordinator in Florida. So by the way, how many conference scout coordinators do we have in the room? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. seven ish on the way. So seven, okay, that's great. And just for geographic, if y'all know Florida, the Florida comes goes from just west of Tallahassee down to Key West. So that's my area. Okay. Okay, great. That's a lot. So yes, what are some other reasons why? Right here, all of a sudden. <laughs> what are some other reasons why you might need a conference scout team? Well, he just brought it up when he talked about the size of the Florida conference. Geography alone. Yep. You, you, you can't, one person can't be in Geography anywhere. alone. You know, South Carolina is small, uh, but I go all the way from, you know, I'm your next door neighbor, all the way up to the, to the uh, ocean. I've got three 
Boy Scout councils, right. geography alone. So geography alone. Be, so that'd be DS. Exactly. Well, yes. all the geography, so I live in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. I have all of Wyoming, oh, yeah. Colorado, yes. Utah, Montana, and Southern Idaho. He has to speak. I'm here. <laughs> Easy. Okay, you get the span of control. So, 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 uh, uh, I, yeah, I was going to say, just the simple fact that, you know, my conference covers at least four councils yep. in various places. So, you know, that's really important. Having somebody just in that local council, yeah. uh, because they, they know where all the bodies are in that council, yeah. and I don't. Actually, that's, that you just weaved in two points there. One is you touch a lot of our partner agencies, so you need more because you can't interact with four different BSA councils and who knows how many Girl Scout councils, right? Okay, so, but but also you, our ministry is about establishing relationships in the church world and in the scout world, scouting world, right? And so you. Get, you can only manage so many relationships. Or Jeff, I'm good. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I don't have Sir Dolso on the, our, our conference committee on disability. And, and we have often similar things to do is, is you know, to meet with churches and interpret and, and all sorts of things. One of the things you find out really fast is that you can't be two places at once. That's exactly right. So even if you did work 24 hours a day, you couldn't get around. There's just eight, 700 churches or whatever. Yes. That kind of t uh, tells what he says a backup. Um, let's face it, a lot of us are no spring chickens anymore. And yeah. you know, a simple broken hip could put a guy out of commission for you know four or oh, five yeah. months. Right. Uh, so it's important to have a team to have uh, backup. Okay. So that. These are all great reasons. Let me go ahead and share a couple of others that others have shared with me. First off, nobody knows everything. You don't know everything about Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and Methodism and Big Brothers and the conference level and the district level. We don't know. So if you have more people, maybe collectively, you might know close to everything, right? So that's one thing. Uh, you can't be everywhere at once. You just mentioned that a couple of you guys did. Also, having a team is helpful if you decide to host a training event or a Bishop Scout March or Bishop Scout there, you need more than one person to do those kinds of things. So if you want to put on program or training or awards or well, that's a different thing, um, it would be nice to have a team of people to pull together to like put on this conference. We had a staff of 20 something people putting this conference together. It's nice to have a team to be able to do that. Uh, Chris, here's, here's another one that's actually the other side of that. Sometimes it's really good to have a team to tell you that's not really a good idea. Ah, <laughs> great point. That's, that's exactly right. One person doesn't have all the connections to all the local churches in their area. Yep. Huge. That is probably the big, single biggest thing. And not just all the local churches, all the DSs and the district lay leaders and the conference level. No. The other thing is, chances are, if we are doing this, we're volunteers at the conference level, we probably have are filling servant positions in our local church and our district level as well. Yes, right. Okay. So these are all great reasons. I want to go through a lot of things here, but I think we understand there's lots of reasons of why we're going to build the conference schedule. We'll take one last comment before I move on. As well as the lady clergy division, because who you know, it depends on whether you're lay or clergy. That's right. Often. And if, if you know more people or you're more connected to the right people, you can get more work done. You're not, you're not butting your head up against a wall, because a lot of us, we feel like, gosh, my bishop doesn't want to even take an appointment for me, or I, you know, she doesn't support me, or he doesn't support me. But if you know the right people, you can actually work your way through and get some support and get things done. Okay, excellent. So, you need a team. You talked about that. So, let's talk about what kind of team might you need. Forget about what size. And let's assume you can find the people that you want and, and deploy them in a certain way. So, but first thing I like to think about from a marketing and sales perspective, that's sort of my, my day job, uh, who am I serving? Who am I selling to or serving? Well, you could be looking at this from different perspectives. Um, I, I work, I really support the minister, because if I work to the minister and convince him or her that this is a ministry, I can really move some things, start new units, start prayer programs, let's say. I could also think about the COR, the Charter Organization Rep, or the Girl Scout equivalent of that, the Scouting Coordinator. I, I want to focus on that person, because that's the person who really runs that ministry in that church. I could also think about lay leaders, the conference lay leader or other uh, leaders at the local church level. And then I could also think about the key scout leaders, scout master, committee chairman, or cup master, committee chairman, 
troop leader, Girl Scout troop leader, committee chair. So you think about those are four different uh, focus areas that you could focus your time on. One of the key points I want to make here is that's at one church. And to contact those, that's really probably eight or ten people with the scout leaders, multiple leaders. Can you really spend enough time to develop relationships with eight to ten people in a given church? I'm going to suggest no. Otherwise, you're only doing one church or two churches because you only have so many calories to spend. I was going to say, and the other one is the tie to religious relations committees in the councils, particularly for BSA. So who does that team support? Also that BSA committee. Okay, uh, okay so that's a... Um, I may be ahead of you or sidetracked. Yes. No, that's actually a, a, a very strategic question. You want to have relationships with lots of different folks. Where do you want to focus your relationship? Is it at the council, BSA council, or the D G or Girl Scout council, the Big Brothers office? Is it with the church? Is it with the scouting units? You're going to touch base if you're really effective and you're in there long enough to establish relationships with all of those people. But who is your end customer that you're really trying to serve? Because you're rallying all those other people that we just talked about in your in your ecosystem, in your community, to do something. And what we decided, we had this very thoughtful discussion five years ago. First off, in the North Georgia Council, where I'm the Conference Scout Coordinator for, um, I replaced a guy who was a Lone Ranger, a long history of Lone Rangers. We never had anything besides a Lone Ranger in Georgia. And he asked me to ride shotgun for a year and take his place in a year. And I said, what help do we have? He goes, no, it's just us. It goes, with, at the time, 900 churches? You've got to be kidding. You were what, what can we do with 900 churches with two of us? Get up an annual conference and say a prayer and say, come and talk to us. And so I said, no, we're going to bring in some people. And so we decided to build a team. We didn't know how big it would be. But we said, we're going to bring in some people to help do certain things. And we actually sketched out on a piece of paper, well, we don't want somebody to be a prey expert because we want to promote that. And maybe somebody to start new packs or troops, help ministers, and, you know, think that through. And maybe district scout coordinators, and that's about as far as we got. But we put that on a piece of paper, and we started talking to people that we knew. Okay, so we'll talk about that process later. But in terms of that, once we recruited the first couple of people, we got the first four of us together, and we said, who's our, who's our customer? Who are we trying to serve? And we came up, we discussed all four of these, we discussed these other people in the community. Those are more our partners in trying to serve our customer. We selected the COR. We could have selected the minister or some of the others. Okay. What's a COR? Charter Organization Representative. So it's that, a Boy Scout term. It's a Boy Scout term. Now the Girl Scouts have a scouting coordinator. Uh, uh, what's the? You, you have one. It's sort of a made-up term. Yeah, the, we don't have anything official like the COR. I, we have just informal people like myself who represent Girl Scouts. So church. up until January of this year, because Susan Saunders and our council said the Girl Sherry. Scouts have started sharing. They have actually started a, uh, a program. There's a patch in the Girl Scouts. They now have an equivalent, uh, but there's, it's, it's, it's a different situation. But there is a Girl Scout coordinator position at uh, some institutions, and it's just now rolling out. So that's brand new. So there's a, a Girl Scout equivalent to the COR. But the COR in most churches is the local scouting coordinator for a Methodist church. Now we are standing up, as you heard in the last session, and they're having this other session now, a more official program around a local scouting coordinator, which is something that's long needed. And so we're going to be rolling that out over the next year, all the different courses with that. So we are taking that to the next level. And that is a different position than COR. So next time I do this training, I'm going to have a local scouting coordinator up there. But that's actually local scouting coordinator, theoretically will report to a district scouting coordinator who reports to the conference scouting coordinator. So it's part of our organization. And these are the people that the LSCs and the DSCs and the CSCs will work with at the appropriate level. So we selected COR because we felt we could get more done. If we have to pick one person in these environments, now we're not going to ignore the others. We're going to go meet them. But frankly, at a place like John Street Young Methodist, we have eight units. You can't know two sets of scout masters and, and committee chairmen and all those levels. And you don't. And really, they report to the COR anyway, so you don't want to get underneath the COR because that really gets into mismanagement stuff, and the Spanish patrol is just too hard. So we just, and the ministers are good. And we do want to talk to ministers, especially where we don't have scouting units, because we want to convince them to start scouting units, right? But where we have a scouting unit, our t first target would be the, the COR and the minister, if you will. So you're just, just trying to focus our efforts. In a lot of churches, the COR is the minister. There you go. You get a, yeah, especially smaller churches. That, that's a good point. 
Hey, Chris, just quick question. Uh, instead of going from, from the PSA side, instead of going through the individual councils, because Florida has, I think, six or seven four PSA councils, is there someone at the national office that could give us a listing of all the currently, current re chartered, uh, chartered organizations that are in United Methodist Churches? Excellent question. Yes, there's a resource. Stephen Scheid and his office is in contact with uh, Wendy and some of the other at the national okay. office. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they provide us a list once a year of all the Methodist okay. charter organizations. He's Stephen breaks good. it out by state. He can't break it out by Methodist conference. Right. But well, I, he gave me one for all of Georgia. And yeah, I got I one. My kind of far south Georgia, we yeah. figured it out. I got one about three years ago, and I, I, I ciphered it down to the United Methodist churches, and that's, mm -hmm. that's like two years old now. So my, my district has that list. So and then the Girl Scouts have it, and I get it from there. Organizations Boy Scouts have. So, so there's two things here, top down, bottom up. So yeah. I can go to the Glen Eyre Councils. We yeah. touch nine BSA Councils yeah. and two Girl Scout Councils. So we reach out to all 11 and ask them for their roles at the bottom. And they give us, here's all the Methodist yeah. churches in the Flint River Council, Glen Eyre Council. That's great information. I get the information from Stephen, which comes from National BSA, and then I compare the two. Right. And there's differences because yeah. of reporting yeah. lag time and that kind of stuff. And, and the Girl Scout Council gives him the list of all the Girl Scout troops at the United States Church. Oh, great. Okay. So the Girl Scouts just started five years ago using Salesforce, and they're asking all their troop leaders and key account executives and all their membership people to begin to put everything in membership, which is great because you can say, who meets at a Methodist church? So Methodist churches don't sponsor Girl Scouts, but now the Girl Scouts can tell us which ones meet at a Methodist church. Oh, that's interesting. So now we know that we have uh, 246 Girl Scout Troops, Land Area Council, and the, uh, excuse me, the North Georgia Conference with two Girl Scout Councils with about uh, 4,000 girls. So we, we know those stats because we get that information from, that's a bottoms up versus a top down thing. Just be aware if you, if you decide to do that, it can be very intensive because councils a lot of times list things by town names or right. by the church name, which doesn't line up with what the town is, which doesn't line up with what it is in the church district. Right, right. So, so you're going to have to dig through deep, all of it. Detailed analysis. So, so what we did in North Georgia, I'd be glad to share this with you. We created a simple spreadsheet. This is the 900 churches at the time. We're at 800 now. And I said, here's the name of the church. Here's an address. Um, and I got this information from our conference. So they said, here's our 900 churches. Great. So then I started asking, because I didn't know Stephen Scheid's office had this information. So I went to Atlanta Area Council. Flint River Council, Northeast Georgia Council, and I started getting information from them. And some were cooperative and some weren't. And I would get some information. But over the time period, back to the, the committee thing, somebody said having relationships in multiple councils. And so eventually, we have somebody in each of those Boy Scout councils. So I tag your Northeast Georgia, your Flint River, your Atlanta Area Council. So we have liaisons on the committee who liaison so they can pull that information in. Anyway, so we created this Excel database. We then we started at so I got the land area councils. So it tells me, you know, Johns Creek County Methodist Church has four packs, and this is the membership. This is the adult membership. Oh, great! So I add that in a spreadsheet, and I get the Girl Scout Council information. I would add that. Sometimes you get good information, sometimes not. Back to Cliff's point, you know what? What what the Methodists call a, a church, and what the Boy Scouts call a church, are sometimes different things. So you have trouble reconciling them. So just be prepared for that. But now, if a minister calls, and you know, and is asking about scouts, I can tell immediately, I can look in the spreadsheet if, it, if they have sponsored in the past, or if they do, if they uh, uh, have, or if they're sponsoring now, or if I talk to, and they should know that, but sometimes if they're brand new, you know, they may think they, they don't, but they, they actually did, and they went for me or something. But also, a DS will ask me, and it's really nice because they got it sorted by district. I can run a list of the DS, here's your 52 churches, and here's which one to have scouting units. And I can also give that to the district scouting coordinator because now I can give her or him a specific list because the Methodist districts are much bigger than Boy Scout districts. They usually span yeah. two and a half to three districts on average in our world. And, and Girl Scout worlds are even bigger. And so they don't always overlap. And so it's really helpful if you can think about creating your own database. It's sort of off topic here. But let's yeah, I'll start that with the initial stuff that Steve, Stephen sent me when I first got on, on board. And I, I just need to get more updated BSA list. Because when I have one, like, it's about two years old. So I know with the recharter process this past year especially, 
if it's anything like the Central Florida Council, quite a few units will, will probably have lost, like they we all experienced this past year. So that, that gets into a tool where I want to try to focus our conversation okay, here, and I, and I got off on a bunny trail there, so I apologize for that. But um, So let's think about building the Carver Scout team and sort of go back to that for a second. Um, so before I was giving you who our customers would be at the local church level, but that's not just it. We also deal with the district level or the conference level. So are there any district scouting coordinators here? Two, oh, well, your conference, right? Conference, yeah, I'm sorry. District. Well, you're a conference. I wear three hats. So. Yeah. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're multi tip you're okay. I'm a local district guns company. Got it. Um, so um, you, you want to tap into the uh, organization at the layer you're in. If you're a district, you want to talk to, you want to meet the district superintendent and the district lay leader. Those should be your best friends. At the local church level, yeah, it's the COR and the minister, those two. So that's who you focus on. You want to be friends with everybody. But if you're going to reach out and you want to establish relationships, at your, at your level, it would be the district lay leader. You actually report to the district lay leader. You're actually on his or her team. District scouting coordinator position, you're on the district uh, board of lady, is the, or some people call it, or district connection ministry. And that's with the, the uh, camp. That's with the, the youth outreach program that we sponsor. That's with... Um, several other youth organizations we have a committee. <clears throat> okay, so you have a separate committee. That's interesting. Um, but I, as, as I think about a conference scout coordinator too, district scout, so we all are members of the conference board of lady. Did you guys know that? Does your conference know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's not a funny question. That's a real that's question. Key, yeah. Because some of us have I a know. difficult time even getting on there. So. And yeah. if you go back to the Book of Discipline, it says that the conference scouting coordinator uh, is part of the UMM. He's on the UMM executive board, but he's also on the conference board. So as conference scout coordinators, I sit on both of those boards. You do too, those who are conference scout coordinators. Okay. Um, same thing at the district level. You, you report to those two. So invite yourself. Call, usually those persons are looking for us. Maybe not always, and Cliff's got an unusual <laughs> case. And sometimes they just don't know because it's... We, they've had nobody for 20 years, and they just didn't know any better. And, or, but it, most of them are welcome to say, "Gosh, you're the scouting person. Okay, great. Won't you? Here's our next meeting, and then invite yourself to the meeting. You will get more done at that meeting than anything, any other single thing you can do." So Jeff Carson in the room here, he was a district uh, scouting coordinator for us before he took on special projects, and he uh, has been an integral part of his district. Uh, what do you call it? Connectional ministry. Uh, yeah, connection ministry, but for laity is the official. And so he's been going to that meeting for years, right? Years, yeah. yeah. Friend, it, friends that are doing that have done other things and are doing other things. So mm -hmm. you, it's like things you know, just continues to grow and grow and grow. So Jeff is actually teaching a course uh, Thursday about navigating through the United Methodist Church. How to identify these specific committees. There's a ton of committees. It's overwhelming. Which one or two committees should I focus on? as a district or a conference scouting coordinator. That's, that's hugely valuable. So we'll spend more time on that in a couple of days. But the, the point here is, as you build your conference scout team, be thoughtful of this too. When you appoint a district scouting coordinator, the well, first thing you do is tell her that I want you to be, get yourself at the district board lady and get yourself invited to that meeting. If you need my help, I'll make the help. I'll come over to talk with the conference board lady, get the introduction made for you to get you in there. Okay. Who appoints? District conference coordinator. Different uh, CSCs, conference scout coordinators. Hmm? Conference scouting coordinators. Who appoints them? So it's one or two people. Um, either the conference board lady or the conference UMM president. Or your predecessor. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. But it happens that way a lot of times. Yeah. Just like with some packs and troops, which is a whole so, way for succession management. But yeah. Yes. Say the technical term is that person would nominate them and it go, would go through uh, annual, conference. annual conference nomination. Yep. So process-wise, that would all have to go through conference nominations and approved that way. Perfect. Spoken for minister in the middle of the... <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. Well, I, well, I asked because I'm not aware that our annual conference has any of those. 
great educational uh, opportunity. So, so out of 45-ish, and I don't know what the current conference count is, but let's say have, we have 45 conferences, mm -hmm. I suspect we only have conference count coordinators in 30 of them. Mm -hmm. That's a guess. I don't know if anybody else has a better guess. Okay, but um, the guy who recruited me was my predecessor, and he, he put me in front of the conference UMM president, and then he started having me going uh, with him to the conference board lady meetings. And so he was already going to him, so I started going to him, so they got a chance to know me for a couple of those meetings, and then I started going without him, and they had already told him, here's the guy I'd like to recommend. So after they saw me a couple of times, and figured out I wasn't a total knucklehead, then they, they sort of already presumed that I was going to replace him. Our United Methodist Men's Board for our conference said, hey, we need a scouting coordinator, tag, you are it. We'll get it approved by conference. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I, I gave you both answers, most of the time it's UMM president. But sometimes, some UMM conference organizations aren't the most organized. So they, sometimes they're incredible, sometimes they're not. And so they may not even know I, they need a conference scout coordinator. And then until somebody raises their hands and says, I like the job. I was going to say, just navigating the Methodist nominations process uh, can be a little daunting sometimes. Um, <laughs> And particularly as we're building a team and you're looking at districts, sometimes they will slot people in and say, um, we need to fill that district coordinator position, and they'll pick somebody who has no experience at all. Oh, that's the worst thing. That's, that's exactly right. Um, so providing names is one of the best things you can do. Yeah. Uh, and get that through either the United Methodist Men or the, or the Board of Laity, or you're nominating committee, you'll have a district rep on the nominee from the conference nominating committee. So let's uh, move to the second step in the process is what kind of team do we need or would you like? And by the way, we have out of the 30, estimated 30 conference scouting coordinators that are actually appointed, uh, we have about three that are conference scout teams that we're aware of. We have Virginia, we have South Carolina, and we have Georgia, North Georgia. Is, does anybody else have more than one person in the conference scout team? That's fine. That's, that's the norm. Okay. So what we're suggesting is something maybe a little new to, to most of us is consider inviting at least a couple of other people in there. If nothing else, you've got somebody to replace you in a few years, you know, so you're not holding on to that job forever. But maybe also creating more excitement, more energy, and more capacity and capability to do things. So what kind of team do you need? I, and I want to suggest the question you just want to ask yourself in order to answer this question is, what kind of activities do you anticipate doing? So, I've uh, just spent a couple minutes brainstorming. What kind of things do you see a conference scout team, if you had more than just yourself, that you, you could do? How about chaplains and chaplain training? Excellent. Provide, provide chaplains, but also chaplains training. Excellent one. Straight uh, process uh, uh, conference level or district level uh, award nominations. Excellent. Some Methodist awards in particular to actually recognize all the great work. That I that's a great. Roman, do you have something? Yeah, the, the uh, promoting Scout Sunday celebrations. Excellent. Because Scout Sunday is where you could do all these awards. Excellent. And not only making sure that the CORs are BSA trained, but also trained Ooh, with us. That's a yeah. big one. And what would the ultimate objective of that be? Well, that they would know how it's supposed to work, <laughs> so that they would be able to fit into the system. Exactly right. And if I may put some additional words in your mouth to build the Please. point, the way we want to, I'll get you next time. The, the, the thing that we want to do is we want to build, we want to help our ministers and scout leaders understand that scouting is a ministry or can be a ministry. And we do that through the CORs. Because if we start with the CORs, they can make sure they select scout masters, cub masters, or troop leaders, and, and committee chairmen who actually believe the same thing. Oh, I want to choose a Christian who's my scout master, not a Hindu, or not somebody else, or somebody who's agnostic and doesn't care about it. I want to look at some of the talk pro, a pray program who actually does want to make sure that they appoint a chaplain's aide and a chaplain, that kind of stuff. Somebody who's thinking, I actually want to spread faith through scouting as opposed to an agnostic or an atheist. So doing that through this focus on the CER, COR, um, and you want to build faith into scouting. We actually offer a course 
at our Scouters and Witches Academy in North Georgia about building faith into scouting. We have a punch list of 10 things you can do. You know, I'll just mention three or four things. There's other things. And so we want to educate scout leaders and ministers. This is a ministry, and here's how you can go about doing it. So that's a, that's a key thing. Shouldn't they also be involved in marketing to the churches that don't have units? Exactly. That's starting new units and helping promote starting new units. Like one of the best ways we did that, we had a Bishop Scout lunch that you're going to hear about uh, this afternoon, actually. Jeff's actually going to be leading that course. And he, he organized one for us three years ago. God, it's been three years or two years? Three years. Couldn't, you know, COVID just blurs yeah. time around. And so we had the Bishop, who was in North Georgia, Bishop Sue Hopper Johnson, who is a Girl Scout in Florida. And so she spoke finally about that and spoke how she thinks scouting is a ministry and that they ought to do prey programs. And if you're not doing scouting today, you ought to be doing scouting, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or anything. So, and, she, and she said it to the clergy. So a third of the audience were clergy. And so she's looking at the clergy in the eye and saying, if, you're not start, if you don't have scouts today, why not? You and should be doing scouting. Bishop says it. And when are we doing three assignments? <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a, a big audience that we need to, to make sure that we're in front of. Shoot. So, Jim, your point's absolutely right. One of the ways we can market is we can use our DSs or our bishops when the bishops are supportive. I understand not all bishops are supportive, but that's okay. If the bishop isn't, find a couple of DSs that are. There are some out there. We're just related. There's somebody in that big mass organization who supports us. Our job is this is to sniff those people out, find out who they are, befriend them, and get them helping to promote the programs. Um, what other activities might we do? Pray program. Pray program, either promote them, also, or conduct them ourselves. Anything else that you can think of? Virginia Conference United Methodist Men used to have an encampment every year. <sighs> That is an awesome idea, and those of you who seen Bill Chapin's patches for the 90s and the 2000s for a 20 years period, I don't know when y'all, uh, I don't think you do them right now, but you did them for decades, where you have Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, maybe one of you even had Big Brothers Big Sisters there, uh, 1,000 people, 1,200 people at a camp out, and it's a faith-based camp out, so they're actually putting on programs, it's just not promotion <coughs> or training. That's, that's an awesome thing. Okay, let's go ahead and move on here. Um, I don't know if I can. Um, I imagine most of your other annual conferences are like ours, is we have a conference newsletter kind of thing. It's transitioned from paper to electronic, but every other month, everybody in the, every church, every lay person that the conference has on their mailing list gets this mail newsletter sort of thing. Yes. The reason scouting is not in that newsletter is because nobody's writing articles for it. That's it. Now, in some conferences, you see scouting newsletters. I mean, you see stuff in our conference newsletters and some of our district newsletters because we have people doing that. But if you don't have, that is a great way to promote it and to get the word out about whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a camp out or a training or a pray thing or whatever. Well, or even just praising the success of one unit and how, how this unit brought children into the church or something, you know, right. and all the churches in the conference are going to read about what scouting is doing for youth ministry in this church because somebody wrote about it. So, um, two things. Um, in North Georgia Conference, we have a newsletter, an electronic newsletter, and we send it out to about 1,400 people, a lot of scout leaders, uh, a lot of clergy, the bishop, all the DSs. I'll make sure the DSs and district lay leaders are okay? So they get, once a month, and some months maybe a little more often than that, a dose of Methodist scouting in the North Georgia Conference. So we will have a picture of a church, of a, of a, of a a church, maybe a Scout Sunday, and a bunch of kids in uniform and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about the academy that's coming up. We'll talk about the annual conference and how, whatever it is, there's always news. To, and I think, Amanda, you are running a Facebook page instead of a newsletter for the Missouri conference, right? Yep. And so that was a way to get it out one way or the other. Wait a minute, let me get Jim first. Stephen Scheid is going to talk about this specifically in a Friday session on a project that St. Louis is doing in this regard, to use the existing Methodist uh, promotional vehicles or newsletters and, and all this different stuff that we have to promote scouting in a free way. That's great. Is that something at the conference level or at the national level? Uh, initially at the conference level. Okay. Uh, excuse me, initially at the district level. But it's got legs and it can go to other faiths and it can go up. Oh, I look forward to hearing that. Um, also, pass along to your COR's, pastors, 
that these newsletters, they should be passing, forwarding them on to their their constituents, you know, yes. to their people who are the Girl Scout leaders. And let them know how, if you want to get the newsletter directly, email yeah. this person. But, but, you know, to tell the people that, like, your distribution was periodically put a blurb in there saying, hey guys, share this with your community, because there are, quite often there are hidden groups that just never hear about it. Oh, they're all, yeah, there's always more groups. Our, our district puts out a monthly newsletter and that the coordinator, but um, Scouting Methodist coordinator is asked to, to submit an article and we have a deadline and I get information from Bill Shapen, who's my conference person on what to put in and so I advertise this uh, an perfect. awful lot. But it doesn't go, it only goes to the people that sign up for the district newsletter and those are not the troop leaders or <coughs> Uh, of our scouting unit. So there's, so, so talk about communication, and I actually want to park a lot this. We actually have a round table when I finish this this building conference scout team. The second part of this morning session here is to talk about uh, anything you guys want to talk about. This whole communication one is a critical one. So let me just make one last comment before we'll circle back to it, okay? Um, when you think about communication, you need to think about communication to two worlds the scouting world and Methodism world, right? Uh, our newsletter is an attempt to do both. But you do need to think about uh, exactly what you're doing through the newsletters, through the Methodist District newsletters. But we also have in our committee people assigned to different councils, BSA and GSA councils, and help. We get it to Sherry, um, who's actually a, a GSA professional from the Greater Atlanta Council. She will take our stuff and put it to Girl Scout channels. We have people who do it through Boy Scout channels. And, and at the district level. So, so you need to actually think about communication in a broader sense because you've got two worlds you're trying to communicate. Here are the specific uh, ideas that we've come up with for, and there's more. These are specific things that your committee, if you decide to build a committee, could do. Number one is start new units. You can start new pack troop. We actually created a new award in North Georgia Conference. We're encouraging people to get the full set of scouting complement. We want them to have a Girl Scout troop meeting there. We want them to have a pack, a BSA troop, a BSA girl troop, and a crew. You get all five of those, you deserve some kind of award. There's very few of those. There are a lot, and we were doing some recognition without, before the BSA started girl troops, Cub, Pack, Crew, and a Girl Scout troop. We had those four. And so, out of our now 800 churches, we have 50 churches that meet all, have all four, 50. And so we want to recognize those and then hold them up for all the others to see, because people say, God, I don't have enough kids. And you look at this 100-person church that has all four units going, what are you guys doing? Right. This is okay. You guys are thinking about something differently here. So back to promotion. We want to celebrate those great success stories. So everybody else, sort of shame in place. Got to it's like, wait a minute. You got these tiny churches that got all the scouting units. What's you know, we, we obviously aren't thinking about the right way. Number two, starting pray programs. When Jeff had that lunch three years ago, we got the bishop on stage, and she said, start a pack or troop or a troop. Uh, she also said, start pray programs. We already had Reverend Luis Ortiz, um, Hispanic minister of 25 years, who started units in six different churches along his 25 years. He gave him gave a toast testimony. He said, I do two things every time I walk into a new church. Make sure we got scouting. If not, I go start one myself. And two, we start a prayer program. Because it's the easiest way for me to have personal connection with families and kids. And that's how you recruit memberships, is you establish connections. Because it's the most effective membership recruiting tool. Now, he knows how to use it. And so he spoke right before the bishop about pray program. So she got up there, and she understood that already. But when she heard that, she really got fired. So starting pray programs is a is a viable reason. Third one is this general idea of building faith or do you need to guide as we say Boy Scouts, but building faith into our programs. So we have a lot of churches in our world that run great scouting programs, but there's not a lick of faith in there. That's a crime because the reason. We met there as partner with you. this organization is so that we could spread faith to the youth. That's why we do this. But if you grow up as a scoutmaster and you didn't see a model before you, you probably didn't even know that's a thing. I'm surprised at how many scoutmasters I run into and come masters. We could talk about faith. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually a core part of the program. I think realistically today, in today's uh, culture, and this has been going on for 20 years or so, in just building, I think our scout leaders are afraid to talk about faith 
Because in a Methodist program, like most Protestants, but particularly Methodists, in my troop, we have Catholics, Protestants of all stripes, eight or ten different Protestant groups, Jewish kids on occasion, a lot by a third of the troop are Hindu, got a Muslim boy or two. It's the United Nations of faith. Most people, most adults aren't don't feel equipped to go talk about faith in that kind of environment unless they're going to offend somebody. But you know what? We have a duty, I submit, that we should talk about faith. There are ways to talk about faith without being offensive in that kind of environment. But the troop leaders aren't Methodists. They aren't members of the church. They may be, but they may not be. So you got to be prepared that they're not. But this goes back to the COR selecting, because the COR, many times for the minister, will actually select the scoutmaster or, or committee chairman. And sometimes they're the same person. And that may be a place where having a chaplain is an important thing, because they can do it if the troop leaders are. Mm -hmm. But then you want to have, um, so at Johns Creek, because I was the COR there for eight years, we basically said, because we're getting a lot of Hindus, which is great, we want them to come in. We had our Thursday night troop was mostly Hindu. We said you got to have at least one of the two key leaders, you know, Scott Master, committee chairman. You got to be Christian. A church could do that. That's, that's not offensive to anybody. It's very consistent with the BSA line. If we want to say they both had to be Christian, you can do that. Okay. And so you should know that. You can share it out with the leaders you run across. Okay. You can make you can make that a requirement. But but for Girl Scouts, you cannot. Yeah, that's right. We can make recommendations on this, but you, the Girl Scouts. Their own leaders, mm -hmm. not the church. Right, because of the type of relationship it is. I mean, yeah. BSA is a chartered, correct, chartered relationship versus just assisting with whatever. Yeah. Okay. So getting back to the purpose of the team, I know we got a lot to run through here. I don't mean to cut you off, but um, I, starting with the purpose of the team, I start first with the first thinking about the kind of activities we want to do. We talked about new units, new prey programs, uh, building faith into our scouting programs, which is the higher calling out of all the stuff. Number four is promote Methodist awards. You said that before. Uh, and also help troubled churches and scout units. Now, Boy Scouting, I don't know if Girl Scouts have any equipment, but they have things called unit commissioners, whose job it is to help, you know, keep units on track, packs of troops and crews on track. But as we know, there's not enough unit commissioners out there to really serve all the units. And, and sometimes they're not really well trained themselves either. I was going to say service units, the, all of the Girl Scouts have service units that are locally based. So that would be the equivalent. Yeah. Service unit director. Service unit. I did not know the term, but I know the service yeah. unit. And they will off, they will have a, a paid staff person as well who liaisons with them in some way. Yeah, the service unit director is a volunteer, and then there's a corporate person. So the Boy Scouts have a separate structure like that to district chair, and there's a right. separate thing called district commissioner, and the commissioner staff is responsible for liaisoning with PACs and troops, providing experience oversight, and answers and that kind of stuff. Um, but so helping trouble churches and units is something that um, they're not getting enough of on either side. So in Boy Scouts, that's something we can do since we're hiring, hiring appointing experienced uh, scout leaders. I think it partners with the very first one where it says start new units, because I was in a church where you know, council is, is keen on starting new units. They're not always good at starting new units. And, and what I watched happen was that they started a new unit in my church and offered really no support at all. Mm -hmm. And they, they recruited all the parents because there was a group of parents that wanted to have their children in scouting. And the, the parents were just kind of dumped in a deep end on their own to sink or swim. And they, they flailed around for a couple of years and gave up because they weren't really offered any support. And what I kept trying to get counsel to do was, you know, bring alongside people who've already done popcorn sales for 16 years and right. and, and, and experienced scouters to... Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. That's You're speaking the truth. There are a lot of councils that do it right and provide that support, the training and the commissioners and all the other things. But, but if council... But can, some don't. Maybe we can. That's right. So we can help fill in the gaps. That's a, that's a great recognition. Is there something else over here? Okay. So and the, the other thing I have here is conduct training. We can actually conduct training to do some of these things. Training of our ministers, maybe. Uh, we've taught a, a course. What's a way to do that? Pardon? What's a way to, to conduct training to our ministers about the, the importance of getting ministers? So we, we've done a couple things. Uh, one, uh, I've taught a class, prepared and taught a class at the Army University uh, uh, School of Theology um, about it, it's clor clergy, how to look at scouting as a ministry. Did a lunch and learn there on campus with their ministers who were getting ready to graduate. 
we're trying to get it embedded into the course, and we still may do that as an educational piece. Uh, so educate ministers is one thing. Uh, another thing, we have a, a course on Thursday here, uh, how to talk to your minister about scouting, to teach us how to talk to ministers about scouting. So that's a course I'll be teaching, or actually Scott, will be, Scott and I will be doing a, a cohort combined thing on that one. So one, we, we want to educate the ministers, two, we want to educate uh, our scout leaders how to talk to each other, how to connect. Um, most of the clergy have a, essentially a retreat, like in our conference, is we have like two days, you can get a program on that where they invite all the clergy. Not an annual conference, but that's a separate program. I don't know. John, do you guys have that? Uh, essentially, we're a couple of retreat days for all the clergy kind of mid-year in your conference. I'm having trouble with the mass. Okay, sorry. Um, in your conference, do you have um, a, essentially a couple of retreat days um, where they invite all the clergy in? There's usually yeah, some kind of elders retreat. Yeah, right. yeah, so that's a good opportunity is to look for when that elders retreat or that ministers retreat because they'll normally offer a two or three day session. Sometime, um, usually, ours is usually in January after Christmas before Easter. <laughs> I think that's a great opportunity to do that if you can get plugged in. Now, you may be plugged in or Jeff may be plugged in their particular district. Uh, and that's something to ask for as you, as you go back. I know in North Georgia Conference, Jeff, what do we have in, in August? Generally, they have. Uh, they go back to uh, Tabby Island. Yeah. District setup meetings. Oh, thanks, guys. I should ask you, yeah, Scott. Oh, the so district setup meetings. Meeting. In January, there is a district training event. And it's easy to get on to that platform as well. Yep. Right. So these, these are ways to communicate. I want to try to keep the, conference, the, the conversation on building. If we have time at the common table, we'll come back to that communication. And just, these are great topics. I don't mean to cut you off. I, I want to make sure we get through the building stuff. So this page looks a little bit like the previous page, but it's different. So the previous page, let me go back to this for a second. Here are some ideas on, on you may, uh, things you may want to do as a conference scout team. And by the way, you should invite all these off at once. If you're a Lone Ranger and you want to add a second, third person, find one of these things that you want to do next. Is it promote prey programs? Great. Then do that. Build some, bring some people in to do that, and then add. It's not you're not meant to. You don't have to do all these things. Just pick out something. Give your committee a purpose instead of just being a block on an org chart. You know you want to do something. Now what this is, if you're going to do one of those things, and this list those some of those things, all those things plus a couple of others, you want to find people who've done that before, who have experience starting a new unit. If you want to start, encourage your ministers to start a pack or a troop. Find someone who started a pack or two before. If you want to find somebody who's uh, uh, to, to promote prey programs, go find somebody to lead your prey programs. Same thing with building faith in the scouts. Maybe you find somebody who's been a chaplain, very successfully in a troop somewhere, and he's really passionate about it. He's taught a prey program or two. Boy, this guy's, he would be a good person to, to pull into the team. Uh, same, and so you can go through somebody who's got experience recognizing leaders, somebody who's got experience working with troubled units. AKA, find a unit commissioner somewhere who's, who's faith oriented, who's got experience doing that thing. The Again, duty to God would be promise and faith for the Girl Scouts? Yes, my promise, my faith. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, the second from the bottom is one that you didn't see on the previous page, but I think it's critical. We've talked about it this morning is navigating around the Methodist Church, either at the local level, the district level, or the conference level. Ideally, at all three levels. You're not going to find too many uniforms that have all the experience, but usually once you get to the conference level, you do have experience below that. But as you look at people, um, they may have experience doing prey programs and also being on the district Methodist, you know, late board or whatever. They may have different ones of these. You don't have to find 100 different people. But as you talk to people, you can find people checking several of these boxes. But as you think about your team and who you might need, look at um, these as uh, characteristics or requirements. Now the last one on here is important. Uh, somebody representing the diverse churches we support. I'm not talking about LGBTQ. I'm talking about we did, um, you have rural churches. You have mega churches. You do have left and right churches, conservative, that kind of thing. You also have um, uh, churches that are very supportive of the conference and some that are sort of anti-conference. Okay. 
you want people in different geography. Diversity, there's a lot of definitions of diversity. So as you don't pull everybody from the same zip code who are all WASTI men, okay? You, you, you want to get blacks and whites and women and men, and you want to look for people from <coughs> all uh, parts of, of this of society. Now, let's talk about helpful experiences. I'm going to get a little more specific. <coughs> If, if you decide you want to help start new packs and troops, where am I going to find someone who's got that experience? Well, anybody here been a district, a Boy Scout district membership chair? Oh, Ross, me? Okay. Um, all you need is one on your team. If you're going to have a five person team, all you need is one person who's got that mindset, that mentality, because they can share that with everybody else. Think about your hypothetically a 10 person team. You just want all these skill sets represented by at least one person. So when you get together and you have a question about, okay, I got a minister who wants to start a pack. What do I do next? You call Ross and say, Ross, help me through this. What do I do? And then he'll have that experience. Or if you have a minister who says, I heard what the bishop said. I want to start a prayer program. What's the first step? I don't have a clue. Then you call your person who is the prayer coordinator for your conference. So Malcolm Wills, who's somebody you haven't met, he'll be teaching the Thursday course on prayer. And he's been leading the the annual prey program at John's Creek for like nine or ten years. He's our person on our team that any of our people call. We get someone who wants to do prey, we call Malcolm. He parachutes in. So just find a person uh, who has uh, some membership and also someone who started a new Packer troop before. You find somebody's got that experience, they suffer the bur birthing pains and that they can actually be a great coach and how to start one. Prey programs, prey facilitators. How many of you guys have, have facilitated a prayer program in here? Anybody led a prayer program? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, those people are great to uh, to go be your prayer coordinator. And guess what? You know, that's an easy list to get. You call Jason Nolan. I've called Jason about once every other year. So give me your list. Everybody in the North Georgia Conference, because he can do that, at Methodist churches or all Protestant churches who led a prayer program. <laughs> And then that's my short list of people to target to go find other prey people. Uh, first, Scott in the back. So each council also gets a report of kids within their council who have earned the God in you, God in them as well. Right, so that, those are the kids. But what I'm looking for are the parents who actually led the kids because I want to recruit them one of my committee. <laughs> Doug. I was going to say, one of the things we found out when we were working on our pro, some of the things we were doing in Greater St. Louis Council is that if I did the pray program, if my kids did the pray program at O'Fallon United Methodist Church, but they attended St. Matthew Methodist and the St. Matthew pastor signed off on it, it looked like St. Matthew did the program when it was really O'Fallon. Mm -hmm. You've got to be very careful. Good point. We, we've had, when we looked at that list, we had, Jim, how many churches did we have listed? that had signed off on awards? A bunch, I don't know, but it's too many. Yeah. It, it was, and in reality, I knew in my district, I had two Methodist churches that did 80% of the awards in our district. And, because I taught some of them, and yeah. then the other guy who taught them. So, yeah. that list that you get from Prey is a good start, but you got to clean it. It, it needs to be cleaned very carefully. And Jason's the first to admit that. He goes, I'm going to give you some data, but let me tell you. And he'll walk you through it. And he wants us to have the data because he wants us to go start new prey programs and right. just to help us do that. But just know that's kind of the, that's right. that's the caveat. Well, also, what you get from Jason are the ministers who signed off on those things. Right. And it's interesting to find ministers, like you look at Scott's report, he does a ton of these every year. So he's like at the top of the leaderboard, if you will, if you look at just ministers. And you find some ministers that are moving from church to church, and they're doing prayer programs everywhere. You you can track them. Like, okay, I'm I want to know that guy because I want to get him involved somehow. So there's good data there, and Jason can help you with that. So remember, I talked to you about that Excel database we've created. So once Jason sends me his data, I can see, oh, there's Cornerstone United Methodist in Inner Georgia. Oh, they offer the prayer program in 1718, 1920. Great. So I can. So now we have a column over there for what years they offer the prayer program. So if they have a full set of programs and they're offering prayer. That is a really active church. So that's just a problem there. Anyway, so look at experiences. Where can you find this whole idea about building duty to God, building faith into your scout program? Where are you going to find people who can help you do that? 
well, there's, you see one, two, three up there, if you, if you can see it back there. Number one is scout leaders who have championed faith in their packs and troops. A chaplain. Somebody who's led uh, scouts' own services. Somebody who's led a prey program at the pack of the troop level. Those are people who do it at the street level, if you will. Those are people, not just about prey, but about building faith into the program overall. Those are people that I'm highly interested in. Number two, is church scout leaders. They straddle that world between church world and scout world. A COR is the first one that comes to mind. Scout ministry specialists. How many of you guys are SMSs? A number of you. Those folks are really good. Uh, one of the first things I learned when I stepped in this position, I met Larry Copper at the 2016 Bechtel Summit, this course up there, um, and uh, he, I'd already heard about Mark Stowe, and you heard, uh, he's retired now, we just heard it yesterday. Uh, but Steve's an office still does this. I guess Steve is doing it or somebody else is doing it. But you can call up to Steve and say, give me a list of all the SMSs in the North Georgia Conference. So I did that in 2016. He sent me a list of 35 people. Now some were sort of retired since then, but some were active. I started working that list. That's where I found Ernest Perry and several other guys that are on our committee today. And they actually checked a number of these boxes. So I'd ask them, you want to be a district scout coordinator, or you want to be a prey person, or you want to be whatever. And I say, here's a bunch of cards, pick one. It's actually better because there are lone rangers out there serving three churches or whatever they're doing in a single church or two. Now they're part of a team. They feel like they're making a bigger impact. So I definitely suggest you guys reach out to your SMSs, call Stephen, get your list. He has it. Um, and then you can actually reach out and call, contact them, and there's a source of recruits for you. Quick, quick question. On the fifth bullet, Fourth bullet down on, on screen, recognition. Uh, does that indicate maybe that at the level of uh, the uh, Methodist? Yeah, so the idea, if because you said maybe one of the things we want to do as a conference committee is promote the medals, the Methodist medals, right? Well, yes, sir, but I'm, I, I would mean uh, the presentation of those awards should be done maybe by somebody at that level? No, the, well, there's, there's two, let me, a couple of points let me weave in to, to address your okay. Topic, okay? Number one is uh, promoting the medals in general. Number two is recognizing them, yeah. right? So they all go through Stephen Scheid's office. They right. have different paths, sometimes the bishop, sometimes the scout leader, that kind of stuff. Right. But they're all submitted to them, and they, they do a great job of sending them right out. And then you, they're usually presented at, uh, most of them, probably 90% at Scout Sunday, but they don't have to be. Uh, and it's usually, um, uh, a COR presenting to a scout master or, or presenting to the uh, 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 the minister or the minister presenting to one of those folks, mm -hmm. usually presenting to each other. I get calls to the conference scout coordinator, given the office I have, would you mind coming in and making a presentation? Yeah, yeah I do. Right. That's why I do every February, March, about eight Sundays in a row, I'm out there presenting these things right. and showing the flag. Yeah. Yeah. And then, because uh, it's a lot nicer to have somebody at a higher level talk about this awesome scout master who's done all these great things. Right. Great. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to promote it, and then we ought to offer our services in helping present those things. Right. Um, I presented uh, two district superintendents this past uh, year ago, before COVID hit. Because And district superintendents are great if they actually earn it. I presented our bishop with the Torch Award two annual conferences ago. Totally unexpected, but because she had that bishop scout there, mm -hmm. which resulted in about, what's the number? 19. Oh, and 19 BSA units when you had a bunch of Girl Scout units, but also 25 new prey programs in the next 12 months. Yeah, yeah. Because she got up there and said, you guys, guys, this is ministry work. This is how you do ministry and scouting. Do a prey program. We had 25 new churches in the next 12 months yeah. because of what she said. Okay. And so, anyway, so, so the Methodist Awards, um, we can help promote them. In fact, in our newsletter, we start in October, starting to promote them for Scout Sunday. Here's the link. Stevens made it easy now because you can actually order them and pay for them online. And you don't have to do that as much paperwork. Was there, yeah, yes. Just a quick, on the cross and flame, you know, like our troop, we have a multitude of different leaders. Some are Catholic, some are Lutheran, and some are actually Methodist. You, Catholic, can, yeah. you could give the cross and flame to somebody of the Catholic faith that's, that's right. serving your troop in that. Yeah, cross and flame, you don't have to be Methodist or Methodist. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And by the way, we have a course, uh, I think John Anderson's teaching it um, Thursday by the, the, the Methodist Awards, so we'll go deep into that. 
So recognition, where can you find somebody? We, we have a person, Bill Swilly, you heard uh, Stephen give him a shout out Sunday, uh, or yesterday actually. Um, he's got one of those 70, 75 year scout leader pens, you know, BSA scout leader pens. He's, he's uh, about, 90, about, about 87 now. Um, and, but he's still active, he's our awards coordinator. That's, he's passionate about that. So, um, in order to find people for recognition, some of who's earned a crossing plane before, or a torch award, or a shepherd award, somebody who's earned it, they really understand the value of it. Or somebody who's been maybe the fancy chairman in their district, they understand the value of recognition. So those are, now troubled units, some of who's been a COR, if you've been a COR for very long, you've dealt with a troubled unit situation, or a change in management. You know, if your COR in a place, like I was, had eight units every year, you had something going on, just whack-a-mole, right? And so it's like SBR, if you will. But you find somebody who's been in that position, they are great to help out the troubled units. And also people who've been in district commissioner and the Boy Scout. Okay. What is SMS? Scouting Ministry Specialists, or Scout Ministry Specialists. What do they do? Okay, so Stephen's gonna talk in more in depth about this, but this was before we actually grew the Scout Conference teams and some of these things. Um, it was Larry Coppock's and Gill's idea of trying to light flames of fire out in Methodist scouting. So they were identifying uh, independent uh, or just scouters out there who were passionate about faith, not at a conference or district level, just anybody in their church, and they would, uh, uh, they would pay uh, an annual fee, they would get newsletters and communication from the, the office that Stephen now runs, uh, they would get updated information, um, they would get a cool patch, um, they would also, in the early years, actually write a report about what they were doing with their three churches, and they were asked to commit to supporting three churches. You pick your church and two other churches and try to expand scouting as a ministry in those churches. Okay, Cliff, you're going to add something there? No. Okay. You, you got it all. <laughs> okay. So, you, you can still, I, in fact, I advocate that you do sign up. Uh, we all sign up as scouting ministry specials. Everybody in the North Georgia UMCOS, I, I require them to go ahead and sign that up. One, it is a source of income to the ministry office, and we know that's important. But it's also, you, you, you're connected directly to Stephen Scheid's office. So it's not filtered by me necessarily. So they get it directly, um, and so I think that's important too. Okay. Do you need to renew annually? Yes. No, every three years or five years? I think it's a three year thing, but let's ask Stephen when we get in general session. Okay? Now, um, this gets into what kind of team. So now we've talked about activities that you want to do, where you might be able to find people who've done those activities that you could recruit, but where do you find these people? Now some of these, to the conversation we had, it's sort of understanding where you might find them. But one is, um, if you want a district scout coordinator, um, where do you find this person? And also a parade program advisor. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, these are the positions. You, so you start thinking about an org chart. We'll talk about finding them in a second. What kind of people would you want to start with? You, most people think about, I need a district scout coordinator for each district. We have eight districts, I'd like to have one per district. And I think, uh, Roland, you were talking about yours, and um, I know Virginia Bill was in here, he talked about, how many, how many districts do you guys have? Eight. Eight, and you got district coordinators for most of them? Working on it. Working on it. I know at one point, it, it fluxes, because some people, people were tired. I know at one point you guys had all of them. So district scouting coordinators is one. I like the idea of having at least one person, it could be one of your district scout coordinators, it could be somebody else, who's just the pray person, who's the expert at pray, who's done all levels, and done the awards, and maybe even knows Jason or whatever, but it could be your resident expert, so you don't have to be. Another one would be an awards coordinator. We have, Bill Spoy, as I mentioned, he's, that's his thing. He likes to be, do awards. It's not quite an advancement, but it's the closest thing to it. We also have a training staff because we want to train all these people and to train clergy and train scout leaders on the things we've been talking about. So Yolanda Ware, you saw her video this morning, the black woman, she's, our, uh, she's in charge of our biggest training event. We have another woman, Rebecca Harley, who's our training chair. So the two of them work together on a number of things. So we actually put together an event. Um, and we use everybody else on the committee to, to teach at that course, so people are, are doing multiple things. But you might have people who train. Now, I wouldn't suggest that's the first thing you think of. Maybe you fill these other positions, and then you start thinking about, I maybe we do a little bit of training. Now, with what Cliff is doing, and Jim Leppert, and all the stuff, we're actually building more training content. There's actually a lot available already. And Cliff will talk about training this afternoon. 
But you guys don't have to go create content. You can just take the content that's available and go repurpose it like anything Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts would do, right? So that's one of the things we would encourage. And if you guys don't have the training staff, um, call Cliff or call us. We have people that will we'll travel for training and we'll help do that too. And if you do have the training staff, call us so we can borrow them. <laughs> <laughs> Another position you might think about, back to uh, a couple of you guys mentioned communication. I think it's good to have someone whose job it is to send a newsletter or do the Facebook account or liaison, give information to the district scouting coordinator so they can get in their district newsletters or those kind of things. Okay. So here is a, this is just a draft, and I'm sorry, Rowan, you can't see it in the background. That's okay, I've got a copy of this from you. Yeah, oh, okay, that's right. Uh, but the idea, this is a sample, the left side over here this is uh, districts. At the time we had 12 districts. Uh, we consolidated into eight districts, just reconfigured the space. And over here we have certain positions, some of the ones I've just mentioned, a parade coordinator, a training chair. Um, we actually have now a chaplain. In fact, Scott is our chaplain on our own cost. And I want to make sure we start every meeting we, we with a prayer. Now, it, most of us can do that, but I love the way Scott lays down a prayer and he really gets us in the mood, so we're just so fortunate to have him on our staff. Um, but you can basically create whatever position you want, if you will. Part of this is you recruit somebody, you get them in the boat, you find out what his or her passions and skills are, and you find something that is that she wants to do. Don't force them in a position that, you yeah, I really don't want to do that. There's enough potential there. If you get somebody who's got the right background and mentality, you can find something for them to do. This is just a sample here, and of course this is in your book. Um, so let's talk about where we can find people. Given the time here, we're going to step through this. I was going to do an ideation session there. Um, I'm going to suggest three communities, and I call it tapping the rings. We all know people. You know people. The people you know also know people. And the people they know also know people. You don't have to recruit all 10 people if that's what your objective is by yourself. You recruit the first couple, and they help you, and they help you. Now, my suggestion is if you're a conference scout coordinator, you want to sort of be in control. You don't want them making all the ask for you because you don't know who's going to be asked and they may not share the same philosophy you do. You want to make sure you're somewhere to control that process. But you do want them to reach out and say, hey, we're looking for uh, some COR, people that have a COR experience and maybe got prey experience, and maybe some girls got a boy, boy scout experience. Do you know anybody like that? And then they can make them recommendations to you, and then you and that person can go talk to them and assess them and make an ask. But the three communities are your scout community, your church community, two different worlds. And then you have that interlap of the two that we talked about briefly. So let's take these one at a time. Within your scout community, you have district leaders, council leaders, and Boy Scouts, as we say, unit leaders. So we have all three of those. And so there's places within each of those worlds that you can go find somebody or find lots of people. And at the district level, how many of you guys have served the Boy Scout district level before? Wow. Okay, just most of us. That's great. So you, you'll get this. Um, not all districts have them. A lot of them do these days. A religious relations chair. Anybody here been a relig religious relations chair at district or council level? Well, I know you started it right before the pandemic, and that kind of put everything in the board. Okay, but you are one. Yeah. Those are great positions to find. If you got, they've already drinking this Kool-Aid about faith and scouting. And they're probably looking for a place to tap into to help them do their district job. So this actually serves them in both ways, if you can find them, uh, especially if they're But really, religious relations chairs or religious emblem chairs, uh, uh, committee chairs or emblem chairs. Also, membership chairs. If you can find somebody like Ross, who is a district membership chair, those people are gold. All right, you find them, you latch onto them, you bring them in. Also, training chairs. We got Rebecca and Yolanda, who have both been district and council training chairs. That's awesome, because then you can actually begin to promote and share this information more broadly. Within the council level, there's a lot of places in the council. The council of religious relations chair, if you will. Um, also, you have uh, most of our councils have something like University of Scouting, or powwow, or a hundred different versions of that. It's basically adult leader training. Uh, folks who are in that world um, are really great people, too, again, with the training aspect. Um, unit leaders, scout masters, committee chairmen, and chaplains are all good positions 
This is in the pure scout world. In the conference or church world, so church meaning, and I put both of them up there, church is not just John's Creek and Methodist, it's actually the conference and Methodism. Um, ask for recommendations. I'm not gonna ask my boss, my conference board lady, to send me somebody. You can, and some people do that. I'm just not heard, sure. They may not understand exactly what I'm looking for. And I've got, in fact, Jeff was sent to me that way by, uh, by our conference board lady. He just said, hey, I got this guy's interested in scouting. I said, great, so let me talk to him. So I talked to Jeff, we met for lunch, and oh my God, this guy's gonna be great. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I, they know that we're always looking for people. So talk to your conference board lady chair, if you're friendly with them, or your district chair, and say, hey, we're looking for people on our committee that have these kind of skills or backgrounds. Do you know of anybody? And they may say, no, I don't. But you planted the seed at the next board meeting you go to. You say, hey, by the way, we're still looking for people. Just want to let you know. And after a while, they're going to get it. Oh, I need. Uh, I, 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 then they become their own lookout for it. At the district level, they're always recruiting, whether it's a superintendent or a district lay leader. They're always looking to fill positions across the district. And that's, that's a big part of their job at the conference level, too. So um, ask them. And a lot of those same people serve on other committees like the uh, Board of Ministry when they're interviewing new pastors or uh, local pastors and they meet with them every year and you've planted that seed in their mind and at some point in those other conversations somebody, one of those new, those new pastors mentioned, hey, I'm also involved in scouting, life goes on. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, district related leaders, district superintendents, uh, Make friends with, in your district, you need to know those two people and get to know them so they get to know you. And when I go to district board meetings or and I, I go to some districts and I conference board meetings, I'm always wearing a Class A uniform so they know there's a scout guy. It's brand new, okay? Um, also, annual conference. Every conference has annual conference meetings, usually three to five days depending on the year, right? Um, ask to speak. Many times, most conferences, they want somebody from Scouting to get up in the, in the ministry time and give three or four minutes speech or do a video or something. Also exhibit. We make sure we set up a good 12-foot display. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, Big Brothers, we, we put it all out there. And we'll bring a team. That picture I showed at the beginning of the presentation, those five or six people, that was taken a volunteer lunch at the 2017 annual conference. Uh, some people already wandered off. We had a 10-person team. We'll take 10 or 12 scout leaders, and of course Scott's there, and he'll pick one day to wear a scout uniform. We have five ministers on our conference scout committee, uh, two female and three male. And so they'll, they'll pick a day and they'll wear their scout uniform, showing that the ministers are actually in scouting too. It's powerful. Now they're not walking the booth because they got to be in other places, but at least they're showing the flag and they'll drop by. But that's where, out of the 25 people we have, eight of them, we've recruited an annual conference. That's where we found the ministers. <laughs> or most of the ministers, they come by and says, oh, you guys are really doing some stuff. You know, I used to be in scouting. Oh, really? Where are you now? I'm at Waterstone. Oh, no. So are you, are scout you scouting Boy Scout leaders and Boy Scout ministers, or are you trying to reach out to all the Boy Scout leaders? So, in front of the back, if you couldn't hear, she's asking, are we reaching out to Boy Scout leaders or Girl Scout leaders? We're reaching out to all of them. In fact, what we do is the Scots idea. We, we create stickers, four stickers. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Big Brothers, and Campfire. And when we're talking to you at our booth, we'll say, here's the four programs. Oh, I was in Campfire Girls. Well, hey, can we put this on your name tag? Oh, I was in Girl Scouts, too. Oh, let me put that one. And so someone will walk away with two or three stickers. Mm -hmm. And so then they, when they go around the conference, people say, where'd you get that sticker? Like the Scout booth. And people, I want a sticker. And, and, and so by doing that, we're promoting all of them. So are you wearing your, your Methodist Scouting uniform or your, your Class A? I'm wearing my Class A Boy Scout uniform. We'll have somebody make sure we're in a Girl Scout uniform. Some of us will be wearing a Methodist Scouting uniform. We, uh, a, a Class B shirt like this. So we'll wear all of them. So it's not just Boy Scouts. Now, there are some conferences it's all Boy Scout because that's really what this ministry's been about for most of its existence. And I know we're really starting to put on and have the last five years Girl Scouts aggressively. Okay. So we, we, we show the flag for all of them. And that's what we'd suggest you guys do too. Does that get to your question? Okay. Yeah, he's he's added three Girl Scouts onto this committee, including me. 
to try and address your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're also more than Girl Scouts, though. Well, because Boy Scouts are recruiting girls now, and so it makes it a little bit of a challenge when we're at the Methodist Conference. And, and if a girl comes up and says, oh, or, the, or a mother says, I've been a Girl Scout, they said, oh, we can use you as a Boy Scout girl, girl troop leader. That's a wonderful suggestion, and uh, we're going to, uh, I actually want to go ahead and we, you uh, go address on. that. I think the addition of Girl Scouts, BSA girls and Girl Scouts, having them both in our toolkit gives us more opportunity to capture more girls. As Sherry's predecessor said, when the Boy Scouts first announced that they're going to have girl troops, um, after all the initial hullabaloo, she was at one of our home calls, quarterly meetings, she goes, I don't know what everybody's getting upset about. Only 10% of all girls are even in Girl Scouts. There's 90% that there used to be or not in it anymore or, or never have been in it yet. There's plenty of girls to go around. So that's, it's not what we're fighting over some 10%. In fact, in North Georgia, because I've been tracking the numbers, even though the Boy Scouts in Methodism, we started about 40 BSA girl troops, Girl Scout membership has grown by 50% in the environment we've had in, in, in a three-year period since that happened. So both of them have grown. So we've been very uh, supportive of the BSA Girl Troops and very supportive of the Girl Scouts. We make sure something from the Girl Scout Councils are on our board at our meetings. We're adding more people to it. We're promoting both programs. I don't think it's either or, and that's a false, that's a false argument out there. So out of the BSA Girl Troops, out of those 40 some odd troops, um, 30 of them have Girl Scout Troops. Wow. And, and 30 of the churches. The churches, right. Out of those 40 churches, 30 of them. So it's not that they're trading off. We're adding to the Girl Scout troops. They're not closing one to form another. Usually these are siblings of kids who were Boy Scouts and for whatever reason didn't go into Girl Scouts. And they're different programs. There's pros and cons of both programs. And so some Girl Scout troops we all know aren't really outdoor adventurous because the mom who's leading the troop doesn't like camping or something. Okay, and so, so those girls who really want to do the outdoor adventure stuff, they might go into a BSA girl troop. But there are Girl Scout troops that do camping and hiking. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm not, I don't mean to say all Girl Scouts that way. And Girl Scouts are getting more and more uh, outdoorsy and that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the press. But, but there's other reasons to go into Girl Scouts. There's other parts of, the, parts of their program that is not duplicated over here. So you got to look at both programs. There's absolutely pros and cons of both. Not cons, but there's pros of both. So we talk, we talk both of them up openly. And we are aggressively pushing Girl Scouts and, and supporting the BSA Girl Troops. So, in fact, that award we have, we want all five. We want and a healthy, not healthy, but a super church, if you will. A super Scout Church will have both. Okay. Um, again, we're still thinking about uh, building a conference scout team. Um, within your scout community. Okay, um, wait a minute. Have we already talked about that one? within your conference church community. Um, you can talk to your scout leaders at your church. Some of your scout leaders only do scouting, but a lot of them are actually on the UMM board, or in some cases on the UMW board. And so they're, they're connected to the church. They can help you navigate the church world. Um, CORs are excellent people to look at. Retired CORs are even better, because they've got an experience, and they may be looking for the next new scout gig. Um, Pray course moderators. Um, SMS and Scout Ministry Specialists that we spoke of before. Methodist Award winners, we talked about that before. And Eagle Scouts and Gold Award recipients. Those people who achieve the highest levels of youth. We want to, if somebody tells me they're either one of those two, uh, they hopefully still have a passion for even all the lawsuits and all this stuff going on about scouting. And most of those people actually are interested in contributing in some way, depending on where they are in their stage of life and their stage of volunteerism and their, all that, and their faith and everything. Uh, a lot of those people are very interested. So there's a number of types of positions of people that you may look for uh, as potential recruits. So another part of where you can find people, we talked about attending uh, annual conference, but also conference board lady meetings. We have typically in pre-COVID times a quarterly meeting. I don't, that's a must make meeting for me because I get to connect with district lay leaders in that meeting. Tell one how to find out who your district lay leaders are, go to that meeting that when they go to. That's where you meet them. Uh, at the district legal uh, level, go to your district lay board meeting. That's where you can meet all the other key ministry leaders. Um, attend your uh, 
contact the General Commission United Methodist Men. Uh, it says Mark Stowe here, but now it's Stephen. Um, they can give you several lists. They can give you the SMS list. They can give you the church list out of BSA with sorted by all the ones just for your conference. You can also call, yeah, the last one there is called Jason Nolan. Jason's around this week. He'll be uh, with us tomorrow, um, maybe in this afternoon too. Um, he'll give you a list, as we talked about. Here's all the kids and all the adults in your area that have taught or earned the program. Those are all potential lists for you to recruit. Um, and also, you award recipients. So I called Mark Stowe and said, can you give me a list of all the Cross and Flame recipients and the Torch recipients at North Georgia Conference for the last five years? He goes, well, it's easier for me if I just give them to you for all the time because of the way I keep the database. Here, send me up. all of them. He sent me a list that goes back to 1979. I had a list of every Cross and Flame for the last 40 years. Every uh, Shepherd's Award, every award that they have. He has a database and he can run a list for your conference of all those awards. Now, somebody back in 1985 is probably not scouting anymore. But some of the last five to 10 years, they may still be scouting. But the fact that so they've already earned one of these awards, they've been in the deep pool. They, they've been in the pool where you are now. You know, they appreciate what it is we're trying to do. And if you're trying to put a team together and some structure, they may be willing to actually join with you. Now that there's, there's a team and there's more people and there's more passion, uh, and that's where I found some people too, calling those award recipients. Because a lot of times they did that as a long ranger themselves. It's a lot easier and more fun to do this as a team. So sometimes they'll be ready to do that as a team. Okay, how do you build uh, the team? A um, couple of key principles. Number one, um, don't be too preoccupied with getting all those specific, specific specialties. There's so many different types of people you could use. If you find somebody that has a couple of those check boxes, they're a scout leader, or they're a Girl Scout leader, and they're a prey program leader, or they've done a couple different things, and they're passionate. That's the key thing. Take the temperature on scouting as a ministry. If, if that's the core of who they are, and they seem to be pretty confident in a couple of these things, get them in the boat. And when you get them in the boat, then you figure out where best to utilize them, and where they want to plug in. And give them several options. Be flexible. You may have five or six positions you, you'd like to start off with, don't be, I need to have the prey guy first. You don't, you, know, you don't have to be so dogmatic as I need that. You could have several of them that you're willing to start with. And just go find good people, get them in the boat, then figure out, get them in the right seat in the boat. Okay? The other thing is start with two or three people, maybe four people at most. Don't try to build Rome in a day. Just get, because once you get a couple of people and you start having conversations and, and meetings, the passion builds. And then they throw out ideas that you wouldn't even consider. And they'll suggest connection. You can follow those trails. Okay? And then the other thing is that I allow for a couple of years to build. Again, not building well in a day. Getting people on board, starting conversations, and finding a purpose. We want to promote prey programs. We want to start new units. Find one thing. You can do all these things eventually. You know, it took us about three years to actually get a good sized team built up. And we've been doing this for five years now, so we have a really nice team. But, and we didn't know where we were going to end up. We didn't have any objective to getting to where we are today. We just said, let's add people, get them in the boat, see what we can do, and we, then we started doing training. And we started doing uh, some program stuff. And then we started, and one other thing is bringing people out here. You know, we have eight people from North Georgia this year. We had nine last year. We had 10 the year before. This is building teamwork. And then we have lots of side conversations about where else, what we'd like to do next or whatever. This is a great way to get people into the deep end of the pool. If they're in a shallow end, they come talk to folks like us for a week, they get faith in the program, if you will. Okay. So that's something else I would suggest. And the other thing is, how do you manage the team? Um, again, we're not trying to create a full-time job for you, but there's some basic cornerstone things here in building any team, whether it's in business or church or government, some things that, that I've learned are helpful. But number one, give, some, give people something to do. Have, they, people want to have a pride of ownership, at least most of us do who are called to this. Give them something specific that they can own and do. And, and give them space and room to do it. Give them support. Number two is conduct regular team meetings. It doesn't need to be monthly. It could be, we do quarterly. It took us a while to figure out the cadence. You might do it every six months. You, now with Zoom world, maybe you alternate. Some Zoom and some in person. 
but you do want to have some in person because it's about connections. It's about meeting and building the chemistry between each other and having other members get to know each other. Because just like in scouting, we got good scouts for our kids. Our kids are all long gone, right? The reason we stayed is because part we believe in the mission, and part we like the people we're doing it with. We care about it. We support each other. Some like a small church in some right. We care about on the own cost. We actually care about each other. We we connect outside of the own cost now. It's building that team. In order to do that, you got to meet occasionally in person. So allow that to happen. Um, number three, do things together. That's one of the biggest reasons we want to do the academy. Yeah, we want to teach people, but I want to get everybody in the own cost together doing something as a team to foster collaboration, to foster accomplishment, um, and also move the ball forward in something. We've done terrific things with, uh, um, with the academy through that. So it's served many purposes. The other thing is train them for their positions. If they're a parade coordinator, there's no specific training for that, but if they've been through that, then that's, that's one thing we connect them with Jason, and Jason will school them up. A, couple, a lot of us have actually a lot of prey experience, so we'll, we'll help them with that. If it's a district scout coordinator, we've had a district scout coordinator training in our district for about four years, so we give that, um, uh, that training to them. If it's a, a, a training program itself, we actually have people working on building training programs throughout the year that culminates in the, the academy. You also want to recognize people. Not just people in the conference, but we want to recognize people on our team. And once they sort of do a number of things, they have earned the cross and flag. Most of our team members have earned the cross and flag while they've been on the committee. Some earned it before they got on it. You want to recognize them in whatever way possible. We, we all want to be recognized. Another one is communicate. You guys touched on this early. Uh, and communicate in the conference, but communicate as a team. So you as a conference scout coordinator, um, you have responsibility. If you've got two or three four people, let them know what's going on. It could be just a simple email to them. Or if you actually get a big team, then it's in between your quarterly meetings or whatever cadence you have there. Um, set up and also communicate more broadly outside the team. Maybe you do a website. Maybe you do a Facebook page or a newsletter. But figure out at least one thing to communicate broadly to scouting world and um, church world. And also stay connected. This is the hardest one. Stay connected to the General Commission, to Stephen Scheid in his office. He wants to be connected to us. We just want to be connected to him. Lots of information, especially in these delicate worlds of lawsuits and everything else we want. You know, if you have a question about that you can't answer, call Stephen. He'll spend time with you and get you caught up on that. Um, and also, other conference scout coordinators. We've got seven or actually eight in this room. We've got a few others in the other room. Um, you're going to have on Thursday a list of everybody who attends this conference and our contact information. Uh, we're a small district and conference coordinators. We're a community and ourselves within this, and we should share information. Uh, we hope we had a conference, the first ever conference scout coordinator retreat. Uh, October will be two years. It's coming up so a year and nine months ago. We had hoped to have one this past year, but COVID took it out. It's probably too soon this year, but we'll probably have another one. Once you hear about it, uh, it'd be great to see you guys there uh, because we'll go into more depth and more things you can do as a conference scout coordinator. But more importantly, you get to share among conference scout coordinators. And the last thing I'll say about that is um, it's like a round table. We're a virtual round table of CSCs and DSCs because you'll run across something. You'll have questions like you had really good questions today. You want to know somebody else who's been in your seat before. They can say, how did you handle that? You want to know people at your level or have been in your level before. And so that's, that, I, I strongly recommend that we continue working together as a community. So that's all the stuff that we have here, I believe. Oh, just resources, general commission staff, other CSCs. Um, so what questions do you guys have? Can you do pray in a day? The question is, can we do pray in a day? Um, with God and me, I'm Jesus and me, you can. If you push your kids really hard with God and me, you might be able to. The others, you shouldn't try. I've seen people try. I think that's a bad idea. Um, I've actually tried it once. Our council was putting on a pray day all day long, and they had Jesus, me, family, church, and life. And they all, the idea was they just wanted to kickstart it here. But, but the challenge with that is, and this is my opinion, we can ask Jason's opinion, but his, his thoughts on this. And he and I have talked about this somewhat. Um, when you go through, it's, it's good to go through as a group, 
small group five to ten, no more than ten. You can't do it as a lone ranger, just father and, and child, or mother and child. You can't do that and set up that way. But it's much better if you go through with some kind of small group so the kids can compare and, and they get to learn more that way. The second part of that, if you make that assumption, you want to keep that group together from session one to session six. So if you have a day-long thing and, you, and you're at the family level and you only get the first two out of the six sessions in that day, if you do it right, you can only do really two, maybe three, that's a long day. If you do two sessions, are you going to be able to get that group back together for the other four sessions? Because if you don't, you lost a lot of the energy behind it. And then all of a sudden the kids get lost and generally they don't finish up. If you were looking for just a day event in that vein, you'd probably want to do one of the RP3, R, R3Ps, RP3s? RP3. That, was, that would be ideal. RP3 or Jesus and me, those you can do in a day. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, those are wonderful ideas. Now, if you set up a group, we're going to set up the God and me, or the God and family, and the God and church groups, and we're going to kick you off. But the intention mm -hmm. is to keep your group together you guys can finish up together. I'm thinking of an overnight you come in Friday and mm -hmm. then, then have a weekend and so you uh, you have people from different churches and from different of the scouting Methodist groups going through the, the, mm -hmm. the pray program together. And I think there's huge value that when I've led my boys to especially the church level you know we had seven kids and five denominations and part of that is you have to go to church with everybody in your denomination. So we have to five different churches, you know, Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, and one other. And so every place we went to, we got to meet your kid's minister. And so we had lots of conversation. And you a lot of coming up, well, why do you guys do that? Why do you, why, how come you don't do this? And then there's a really, those are the thought-provoking moments for the kids. And they start learning about their own faith. Hey, Dad, why don't we, why don't we do that? <laughs> um, so that's actually a good thing to do, cross-faith. Good questions. Anything else about building a scout team? That, uh, okay. I think I'm bludgeoning you to death. You can. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to turn it off. We'll let. Uh, I got it. Okay, you want to turn it off. Okay. Um, I know we're running over by a couple minutes. Appreciate your patience.